Hello, everyone. Welcome to our first Pitch Perfect contest as part of our Invest Digital Health conference that we're doing virtually. Uh, this is the third year in a row that we're doing Invest Digital Health, obviously, for the first time virtually. But I wanted to kick off everything by sharing some information about MedCity News for those who don't know our company all that well. So my name is Orunthuti Parmar. I'm the editor-in-chief of MedCity News. We were founded in late 2008 to cover innovation in healthcare. We are a national publication drawing nearly 2 million page views and 500K unique page views per month. We cover biopharma, digital health, medical devices, diagnostics, as well as hospitals and payers in the context of the industry's overall transformation. And of course, uh, needless to say, we're also covering the novel coronavirus and COVID-19 and the fallout from that pretty closely as well. Along with all our um, editorial content, we host conferences focusing on investment, population health, precision medicine, digital health, and patient engagement. We also accept outside content through our influencers program. And you can email me at aparmar at medcitynews.com if you feel that there is something that you need to share in terms of thought leadership. We also have a Med Citizens program, which is a member-based program for startups with editorial and event benefits. And Stephanie Baum leads that effort. Uh, we'll have her email address posted in the chat for any of you uh, that wants to learn more about this program. And then during the pandemic, we launched the Pivot podcast, uh, where we've interviewed many different types of people, including Zeke Emanuel. So I urge you all to go to our website and click on the podcast link, or um, this link can be posted also on the chat and you can access it uh, using that. Again, um, this is my email address. And so feel free to reach out to me if you feel that there is a guest that should be featured on our podcast. I also wanted to take this time and thank all our sponsors without whom this event would not be possible. Unity Point Health Ventures, Fredrickson and Byron and Deloitte are our sponsors for this event. And of course, a big thank you to Medical Alley Association. They've been our partner, uh, partners for three years now. It, this is an industry association dedicated to highlighting and supporting innovation in healthcare in the state of Minnesota. Now I want to lay down some of the contest ground rules today. We have five chronic disease and value-based care startups. Each startup will have 10 minutes, four minutes to pitch, six minutes Q&A with the judges. I will um, periodically butt in at the one minute left mark. I'll provide a verbal warning. And then when the time is up, I'll mention that as well. And needless to say, time, time will be enforced pretty strictly. At the end of the five presentations, we will do a quick online poll to determine an audience favorite from today's track. Meanwhile, the judges will be scoring and the winners from the judges perspective, that will be announced uh, next week, hopefully on Monday, but definitely next week. So it's time to meet the judges. We have Parth Desai from Flair Capital, Matthew Warrens from Unity Point Health Ventures, and Christine Brocado from Common Spirit Health. Matt Warrens is Managing Director of Innovation at Unity Point Health Ventures. He's a senior innovation leader and has strong operations experience focusing on identifying, developing, and implementing new products and services for health systems. Prior to joining Unity Point, Matt served at OSF Healthcare System in various roles, including its Vice President of Innovation Partnerships and Executive Director of Jump Trading Simulation and Education Center. He's a graduate of Bradley University's Executive MBA program and Southern Illinois University's Healthcare Administration degree. Welcome, Matt. Parth Desai. Parth is a principal at Flair Capital Partners. Prior to joining Flair, Parth was an investor at New York Presbyterian Ventures, where he primarily focused on applications of AI to healthcare operations. Parth earned his PS, BS in biology from Boston College, MPH in health policy and management from Boston University School of Public Health, and master's in medicine from Boston University School of Medicine. Welcome to you, Parth. And then we have Christine Brocado. She is System Vice President for Strategic Innovation at Common Spirit Health. That is the parent company of Dignity Health and Catholic Health Initiatives. In close partnership with operational leaders, Christine co-leads innovation projects related to care automation, transportation, 
addressing social determinants, mental health, and ambulatory care transformation. She has held leadership roles at Genentech, Abbott Vascular, Kaiser Permanente, and is a board observer for Ascension Ventures. Christine has an MBA from Georgetown University and a Bachelor's of Science in Combined Sciences from Santa Clara University. Welcome, Christine. These are our intrepid startups. We have Ceresti Health, Lighter Health, Limbix, My Biometry, and Current Health. So first up, we have Lighter Health. Lighter Health is a personalized digital health and nutrition coaching intervention program designed to address chronic disease risk through the adoption of plant-based nutrition programs and clinically proven health principles. Anuj Patel, CEO of uh, the company, will be our first presenter. Take it away, Anuj. Sure, good afternoon, everyone. Just give me one second to load my screen. Great, your time starts now. Great, okay, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. You know, let's think about what we ate today. Um, let's think about all the decisions that went into what we ate for breakfast or for lunch. There's a huge amount of variability in that decision. Food is one of our last analog frontiers. There's a big variety of cultural, economic, um, convenience and even health related options that go into why we choose what we eat. And it's one of the reasons we have a growing chronic disease problem in our country. When you look at the growth of things like type two diabetes, diagnosed obesity, heart disease and hypertension, a vast majority of these chronic health conditions are driven the underlying cause by food. It used to be an analog frontier until now. I'm proud to present Lighter Health the food is medicine solution using digital technology along with analog tools like health coaching to help improve and help people on a guided journey to improve their diet and nutrition. You know, I think LIDAR has five unique value propositions. One, we've invested for years into developing our own proprietary recipe library, of predominantly whole food plant-based nutrition. Because we've curated, filmed, tested, and vetted our own recipes of several thousand different options, we can then take those recipes and break them down into the requisite macronutrient portions. We can then take all of the ingredients that go into our recipes and integrate them directly into solutions like Instacart and Amazon Fresh. In doing so, we're making adoption of a healthier diet as seamless or as frictionless as possible. On top of this digital technology, I'm stacking on top analog tools. What I mean by analog is that if you really want to get people to adopting a healthier lifestyle, you need more than just simply shipping software in order to do so. To really reverse the effects of chronic disease and get people on a pathway to eating healthier, we layer dietary intervention curriculum that is 12 weeks in length, tested and vetted by our director of clinical nutrition. We have our own health coaches and we integrate directly into a provider setting to provide integrated uh, curriculums to address specific cohorts of people predominantly with um, diagnosed obesity or elevated A1C levels um, and get them on a pathway towards reducing some of those risk factors and thus reducing the total cost of care. Obviously our market opportunity is immense. 60% of Americans suffer from one chronic condition, 42% of suffer from more than one, and predominantly they're the four that I just mentioned, of which I think a big portion are a result of diet. Improved diet has enormous cost savings and I don't think I need to tell this audience of you know, some of the numbers associated with them. Our platform, again, you know, is predominantly software, but we, again, we have that analog component of a dedicated health coach providing oversight through secure communications, video chat, um, providing recommendations, and a guided curriculum to help educate people towards eating and healthier. We've designed our own provider integrated, uh, we designed our own software to integrate directly into a provider setting to allow for tracking of adherence. And, you know, we built a pretty responsive mobile interface. Our pricing model is we charge on average $65 per member per month, and we use upside-based risk-based contracting. So when there's a total cost of care reduction, we, say, we share in a portion of those savings. And we've received, you know, tremendous, go -to, tremendous traction in our go-to-market strategy since launching earlier this year. We have a signed pilot set to enroll next month. We have multiple letters of intent, a qualified lead list of over 100 participants, We've tested the efficacy of our program in an eight week setting, and in doing so saw tremendous results in a reduction in risk factors associated with chronic disease. So that is about Lighter Health, and I'm open to any questions you might have. Thank you. 
Excellent. You finished seven seconds before. <laughs> Thank you very much, Anuj. Um, so we'll go to um, Matt first, then to Christine, and then to Parth. So let's start with Matt. Thanks, thanks, Anuj. It's definitely a huge problem, and I'm a strong believer that um, diet is a big part of, of health and well-being. Um, can you take a little bit of time and expand more on the business model? I mean, I know you showed the price, but but uh, who pays? Who who are you going after as far as um, contracting? And then maybe. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit too about, you know, it seems like the majority of patients with these um, chronic conditions, you know, are, are probably either uninsured or Medicaid. And so how would you address that population? So that's maybe two questions, I guess. Yeah. So let me start with your first question. So uh, we go predominantly after, um, you know, population-based entities of which there is a financial incentive to reduce the total cost of care. So I'm talking specifically around self-insured employers. Um, and also talking about predominantly health plans, but really more ACOs. Given the size of our company um, and given you know, the initial traction we have, I'm specifically targeting more regional ACO models um, and looking really at their commercial population or even their self-insured population. They have a vested interest in, you know, for quality measures, but then obviously the total cost of care for you know, addressing some of the health conditions that I, I mentioned. I think you're spot on in your intuition. I actually started my career working for a Medicaid Advantage plan here in New York City, working a lot with FQHCs. And I do think there's an enormous opportunity in that area. Um, I think that some of those problems, some of the problems of the, those populations are multivariative in nature. And I do think long and hard, you know, about the product that we're building in the long term addressing those populations. I think there's a couple other things of our value chain that we need to deliver. We need to do a better job of probably integrating into the, the food supply chain to do a better job of giving grocery delivery to some of the you know, food deserts or underserved areas. I think we have to do more in the prepared meal space to offer a multitude of solutions for people who don't have you know, a kitchen. Um, I, I will say our platform does a pretty good job of adopting based on, even if you have a microwave, you can actually make a vast majority of our recipes. Um, but that said, of course, you know, we can always invest and do a better job there. So I would say there's, Long term, for sure, Medicaid, but I do think there's a lot of meat on the bone in you know, commercial populations. Great. Thanks very much. Uh, let's go to Christine. Okay, looks like we have an issue with Christine. Let's go to Parth then. Um. Thanks so much, uh, Anuj, and a uh, couple of questions for you. The first was, and you started alluding to this, we'd love to dig a little bit deeper, is um, you recognize that a good chunk of this population lives in a food desert, um, do doesn't have maybe easy access to healthy food. And so uh, just trying to better understand, are you planning to contract with food delivery providers, vendors, other entities um, to ensure these folks have access? Um, that, that's the first question. Um, the second was how you cater to personal preferences and specific dietary um, restrictions, or again, you know, just dietary habits that folks have formed over the course of several years. And, and part of that behavior change is, um, is, is just that, maybe behavioral uh, versus just kind of presenting them with, with a set of options. And so just curious how you think about that. And then the, the last question is um, how you currently distribute the product today. Yeah, great questions all around. So um, keep me honest and I'll try to go through them. But uh, first question um, is, yeah, it's a great point. Um, you know, food deserts are obviously like a really big problem. And if you overlay where there are food deserts along with, you know, predominance of let's say type two diabetes, it's almost like a perfect overlap. To, that, to address that, we, you know, have partnerships with Instacart and Amazon delivery. Um, so I think we do a really adequate job of providing grocery access to populations that otherwise don't have it. We're asset light because we integrate in there. We don't actually have to warehouse and hold food. We're just delivering uh, and jump piggybacking off of the existing infrastructure. We're always looking for new partnerships. So depending on where some of our large kind of contract relationships are, we're looking at relationships with um, HEB, Walmart, um, basically a whole variety of different grocery chains that have their own sort of micro delivery services. Instacart just, you know, uh, has a really great partnership with Kroger, which has done 
you know, it's really helpful for us in the Southeast and Midwest. Um, so hopefully I think we're addressing, I actually think we're accelerating, you know, the, the, you know, the sort of inequality that I think exists with some of these food deserts, or sorry, accelerating the, the, un, the making it more even, I guess. To your second point around like taste preferences, that's exactly true, right? So food is super multivariative and very kind of like, you know, people have personal preferences based on cultural reasons and what have you. We meet people where they are, right? And we have a professional chef on staff. We've worked with, collaborated with multiple professional chefs in the past. Uh, as an example, our director of clinical nutrition, you know, she previously worked uh, for a company that was adopting, um, there's like adopting a nutrition guideline in Hawaii and they hired a chef in Hawaii so that they could adapt, you know, local preferences around like poke and like just local taste preferences for that particular region. You know, for our, um, one of our pilots that we're launching in the Southeast, you know, we were working with a professional chef. So in preparation for like the holiday season, we're adapting, you know, basically more Southern style cooking uh, for the holidays around a more whole food plant-based kind of like recipe approach. So we meet people definitely where they are and we're always growing our recipe database. Um, the third, I, I think the third question you had was around like population, like which types of populations we're going after. Um, again, I think I mentioned, you know, we are trying to contract directly at the plan level. So we'll are usually what happens is that, you know, a medical director uh, is usually like our internal champion. Um, someone who has seen firsthand the efficacy of whole food plant-based nutrition, either directly with their patients or even sometimes with themselves. And we use that as sort of our inroad to contract. Um, and the way we contract, you know, again, is on a PMPM -PM basis. $65 I mentioned was sort of the aggregate average. It's sometimes a little bit more depending on whether, you know, certain cohort needs subsidized groceries. It's certainly even more than that if they need more intense health coaching, depending on sort of the needs um, uh, of the population we're going after. Great, thank you very much, uh, Anuj. Uh, we'll go to Christine. Great, can you hear me okay? Yes. Hello, okay, wonderful. Um, so my question was more about operations. So, so oftentimes patients are seeing their primary care physician or even a cardiologist and getting um, diet recommendations, maybe the DASH diet or, you know, low fat, high fat. Um, how do you think about that if the plans are recommending um, the service? Um, how do you then work with the primary care provider, the dietitian to ensure there's, there's one diet plan and agreed upon diet plan? Um, and then how does that information go back to them so that they can track the progress? Yeah, great question. So yeah, our just we have as part of our dietary curriculum, we have like things like a DASH diet built in, right? So like a provider can actually select that as an option. So of course, you know, a big part of this is working directly with providers, educating them on the efficacy of our platform. They actually like it because a lot of times, you know, providers are, um, they know they like, they really want their patients to eat healthier. They know it's efficacious, but they obviously can't, you know, carve out the time to work hand in hand with them. So they like the idea of obviously being able to almost prescribe, if you will, our platform, um, being able to select the dietary parameters. Our platform, you know, allows like we can tag all of the patients for that particular provider. A provider has their own login and they can sort of log in and see adherence and track and basically see exactly what their patients are eating and what their feedback is. Um, our health coaches, you know, basically work, you know, on a they'll check in weekly with uh, the, the patients, but then they'll also kind of provide additional summary reporting uh, to a provider. Um, a lot of times our providers are very much like set in, forget it. They're like, great, like we've prescribed it, and then you kind of take over. Um, and some are obviously to your point, like a little bit more involved and, you know, we can definitely, again, meet people where they are from that standpoint. Great, thank you so much, Anuj. We will um, continue on. Thanks. Our next startup is My Biometry. The company is developing a platform to monitor, manage patients with chronic disease using biomarker data from proprietary sensors and ML to identify, uh, to identify patients at risk of treatment failure. 
The company's initial focus is asthma, where treatment failure occurs in over 11.5 million U.S. patients annually. My Biometric is developing a single-use disposable sensor and device to track a clinically established biomarker of inflammation in breath. Brian Nolan, founder and CEO, will be our next presenter. Take it away, Brian. Great. Thank you, everyone. Hold on a second. All right. So my name is Brian Nolan. I'm the founder and CEO of My Biometry, and our mission is to empower people with asthma to live better and healthier lives. And we do this by predicting and preventing asthma attacks. And we Brian, do that by. I'm yeah. sorry to interrupt. Right. I'm not seeing your. Um, oh, sorry. Your screen. It would be helpful if I shared it. Sorry about that, okay. guys. <laughs> All right. So. <laughs> better. Yes, better. So your time will start. Okay. Now. Thank you. So again, our mission is to empower people with asthma to live better and healthier lives uh, by predicting and preventing asthma attacks. And we do that with a patented sensor and device technology that monitors a biomarker in your breath. So asthma is one of the biggest healthcare problems in the world. It impacts hundreds of millions of patients. It's the most prevalent chronic condition amongst children. And unfortunately, about 50% of people will have an asthma attack every single year. The problem is the current standard of care in asthma, asthma management is failing. Essentially what happens is a physician prescribes a disease management plan. The patient then goes home and has to spend almost all of their time self-managing that disease. Inevitably, they experience a treatment failure. They make their way back to the physician's office. They adjust therapy and the cycle repeats itself over and over and over again. And the problem is that physicians don't have enough time or the right data to manage these patients. Uh, patients just really aren't qualified to self-manage complex chronic diseases. And unfortunately, employers in Medicaid tend to bear the economic burden of all of this. Uh, it's important to note that not all asthma is the same. There's a group of patients who've got allergic airway inflammation, and those are the ones that fail treatment more frequently. They have more ER visits, they have more asthma attacks, they miss more days of work, and we spend a lot more managing that patient group. <clears throat> allergic airway inflammation can easily be identified um, by an exhaled biomarker called fractional exhaled nitric oxide. It's clinically established and part of the asthma guidelines. What's important is to note is that if you track changes over time, you can correlate that to adherence, efficacy of medication, exposure to triggers, and risk of attack. Others have shown that using this biomarker in population-based telemedicine programs can have significant clinical and economic impact. The University of Rochester put together a program with their local school district. They reduced ER visits and hospitalizations by 48%. Uh, if that program was implemented across the entire state of New York, it would have halved the, the spend on ER visits uh, and saved the state about $317 million. So our solution uh, is built, excuse me, sorry. So our solution is built around a proprietary sensor technology. So it's a single use disposable sensor that pairs essentially with a breathalyzer. Uh, we take all of this inflammation data daily and we pair it with other, um, the other guideline-based risk factors that are associated with treatment failure. We build uh, personalized predictive models on that information and then we uh, support the patients with a clinical team to provide uh, oversight, uh, education, and coaching and really to unburden the physician from monitoring the patient's data. We use this to proactively engage patients before the treatment failure occurs. So as a patient's risk is rising, we provide an actionable insight that they can uh, use to reduce their risk. Reduces their risk for a period of time. If it starts to increase again, uh, it triggers another alert. If that alert is not effective, it will get a, the patient will get an outreach from the clinical team. Uh, if that is then not effective, we can refer directly to uh, the patient's physician and then monitor how well that, um, the therapy changes over time. So our plan is to sell the solution uh, as a is a subscription directly to large uh, employers, governments, et cetera. We think it's about an $8 billion addressable market, uh, leveraging a direct sales channel. We plan to start with, um, with self-funded employers and then ulti ultimately make our way into the Medicaid uh, and government market. Our team has quite a bit of experience developing and commercializing medical technologies. Uh, it's important to note that we've all worked together and invested with each other uh, over the course of our careers. And we think asthma is really just the beginning. Um, our goal is to establish ourselves as the leader in the chronic respiratory space before expanding into other chronic conditions. <clears throat> I'm currently raising a series A to support initial pilot, early commercialization, and ongoing product, and, uh, ongoing product development. So I will end it there and open it up for questions. Perfect. Um, thank you so much.
Um, Brian, we will go to Christine first, and then to Parth, and then to Matt. Wonderful. Well, great presentation. So I wanted to ask more about the sensor. Um, how many times per week is the patient um, taking that test? Sure. Um, and then is the sensor connected to some type of smart inhaler, or what's the association between the sensor and the inhaler? Sure, yeah. So the sensor... Um, it, the sensor should be used daily at home. We want to track how inflammation changes daily um, because whether you're taking your medication, whether you're um, exposed to allergy or asthma, excuse me, exposed to triggers, uh, that will change your inflammation. So we need to track that daily at home. So this device uh, is connected to the phone. So this is a cellular connected device. Um, as of right now, it does not pair with a smart inhaler, um, but that's from a data perspective, that's a pretty easy integration. Uh, and I think long term, uh, having all of that data in one place makes it uh, extreme, both sides of the equation more valuable. Yeah. And are you showing the, the test CPT code? Because every time you take the test, you, like the physician can get reimbursed or how does that? So the, yeah. So from a reimbursement perspective, the physician can do this at the point of care and bill for a CPT code. Um, from our perspective, we're looking more at a subscription based model. We're repairing not just the data, but the clinical oversight on top of it and, and how we make predictions on the data. Um, so our plan is actually to sell like a lot of others. Um, and I think Livongo has really led the way here, sell as a subscription to a large uh, employer and, and look at their asthma population as a place to start. And, and the pricing okay. that, we, that we showed is uh, $700 per patient per year. That's in line with what others charge for diabetes and hypertension. Uh, it's also sort of where the remote patient monitoring codes lie on, a, on an annual basis. Uh, it also assumes we're providing the clinical service. If we were partnered with a, a provider network, um, we wouldn't be providing the clinical service and the price would be significantly less. Thanks. Um, okay. Brian, this is uh, part of, I guess, I, I think I'm up next here. Um, so quick question for you. The first is, uh, from a user experience perspective, could you uh, help me kind of better understand um, how folks in engage with this? And so do they think of just doing it on their own or uh, if they feel uncomfortable, they do it? Like, do they have to basically form a habit uh, once they uh, are given this um, to kind of test themselves in a regular cadence. I'm just trying to understand what triggers them to kind of want to engage with, with the solution or, um, or, or, or if there's kind of behavior change required. And then, and then the second question was around uh, just curiosity on why um, you're targeting the employer segment versus the health plan segment to start, not that they're necessarily mutually exclusive, but just um, trying to get a better sense for maybe what the um, challenge on the employer side of things is. Is there kind of um, poor productivity data or missed days of work data um, that, that kind of led you to, to the employer segment as a starting point? Yeah, so on the behavioral side, um, the ideal scenario is, yes, it's like brushing your teeth. You want somebody to do it uh, at the same time every day um, over the course of, of their lives. That's obviously not necessarily the case. Um, and the way the biomarker works. So as long as you're capturing at least once a week, you can get adequate data to start making predictions from. Uh, in terms of what, what are the triggers, um, a lot of it uh, is, is triggered by the app itself in terms of reminders uh, and the fact that they've got a clinical team behind them pushing to make sure that they get the data uh, on the front end of things. So that's sort of the, the frequency and the cadence that, that we would like. Uh, and we recognize that driving behavior change is complicated. Um, but I think others, uh, specifically like ResMed and um, Philips in the CPAP and sleep apnea market, have shown that you can get people to comply with, with a, a treatment protocol. In that case, you know, putting a mask on your head to, to prevent sleep apnea, they get adherence into the 80%. So I think it's complicated, but I think it can be done. Uh, and others have shown that that's possible. On the, um, the health plan versus the, um, versus the payer segment, I think, I think you sort of hit on it I, with the with an ins a self-funded insurer, you've got not just, you know, the savings associated with um, reducing ER visits, hospitalizations, you know, unnecessary meds, et cetera, but also missed days work. Um, so if you talk to some of, you know, a higher tech company, these are employees that are hundreds of thousands of dollars. When they miss work or when they're sick, they miss work. And when the kids, uh, their kids are sick, they also miss work. 
So it's just sort of a, a nicer value proposition uh, around that, that, um, that group. I think the, the challenges in terms of selling to them, uh, it's a long sales cycle, at least 12 months, six months to get them signed up, and then at least six months to enroll all the patients. Um, so I think that's one of the big challenges associated with it. Great, thanks very much, Parth. Let's go to Matt. Brian, um, thank you. Good, good presentation. Um, I've got kind of a potpourri of questions here. So, sure. uh, um, can this, you know, can it be used for pediatrics? And if so, like, you know, how young are you thinking? Um, you know, the smart inhalers that already exist, like, do you see this sensor being eventually embedded in them or them being able to do this? And like, would you see like partnering with them or is that someone who could possibly disrupt what you're doing? Um, and then last one on the business model, you know, baked into that cost, you know, what your costs are, um, it sounds like you're, you know, you have labor, you, know, you, you have the software and you have the SaaS base fee, but you've got the labor cost of the care management built into this too, it sounded like. And so <laughs> what's kind of the tipping point of what kind of productivity do you need as far as volume wise for those, those uh, care managers that have to be successful? Yeah. So the, um, so from an age perspective, um, this current device, so it's about seven and up because there is a, um, a breath maneuver. You have to actually exhale into it at a slow flow rate. So there's a, a compliance with a breath maneuver. Um, we can make modifications to it to make it go to a lower age population, but that just requires a different, um, hardware configuration. Uh, in terms of the smart inhaler piece, um, I think they're complementary, but I also think that we're providing different um, pieces of information, right? So the smart inhalers are essentially using whether you're depressing the inhaler and correlating that to adherence uh, or use of the rescue medication. Uh, but it really doesn't tell you anything about um, whether the medication is effective. Uh, and it doesn't tell you how well the patient's actually using their inhaler, which is a, a sort of a side problem, but about 70% of patients don't use their inhaler correctly, which means the drug isn't actually getting into their lungs. So the data set that we're providing by measuring inflammation is we can tell you whether you're adherent, we can tell you whether the drug is, was deposited into your lung, uh, and we can tell you whether the drug was actually effective. So from, guiding therapy, from a guiding therapy perspective for the physician, it's a much richer data set. Uh, and then for the, the patient, it just helps them understand why they're being asked to, to take the medication um, every single day, regardless of how they feel. Um, cause your inflammation will change based on whether you take it or not, or based on whether you walk outside and their, their, um, triggers outside. So in some ways that they're complementary, but I also think we provide a very different differentiated data set. Um, and then from a business model perspective, we sort of look at tiering, um, the backend clinical team, uh, overseen by a, um, a pulmonologist or an allergist. They've got a team of nurse practitioners under them. And they've got a team of the nurse practitioners have a team of, um, you know, certified uh, asthma educators. So the asthma educators, we have sort of projected managing um, 3000 patients. I think the nurse, the nurse managers, uh, it's nine to 10,000. And then the, the, um, the allergist, it's, it's a step above that. So it's a tier, it's a tiered um, clinical structure trying to get the lowest level. Um, you know, only the, the, only the nurse practitioners and the allergists and, and MDs uh, only address the patients that, that need their attention. Great, thank you so much, Brian. And next up, let me share my screen. Next up is Limbix. Limbix is building a prescription digital therapeutics to treat adolescent mental health disorders. Their first product, Limbix Spark, is an app designed to treat adolescent depression. The company has raised a 9 million Series A round led by GSR Ventures. Currently, the startup is conducting a virtual randomized clinical trial in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, comparing Limbic Spark to a psychoeducational control. John Sockel, founder and COO, will present next. All right, super. So my name is John Sockel. I'm co-founder and COO of Limbix. And I'm here to talk to you about using prescription digital therapeutics to treat adolescent mental health disorders. Suicide is now the number two cause of death in the US and it's a big growing problem. One in 18 are experiencing depression right now. And if you're a parent of a teen with depression, it's a top problem for you. Uh, what makes this problem so worrisome is that we don't have good treatment options and worse, you know, some estimates are saying depression rates were three times since COVID. 
So when a pediatrician sees a teenager and notices depressive symptoms, they have two choices. They can either recommend psychotherapy, which often isn't covered by insurance or has months long waiting lists, or two, they can prescribe antidepressants, which unfortunately don't work all that well in teens and have side effects such as weight gain, insomnia, and most notably, an increase in suicidality. So we built Spark. And Spark is a five-week mobile app program intended to treat adolescent depression. Um, Spark was a, is, is part of a whole new category of products called Prescription Digital Therapeutics, PDTs. And the FDA has started to clear the first few PDTs in the last few years. So what this means is that a pediatrician, once Spark is FDA cleared, could prescribe it the same way they prescribe drugs. And while only a few PDTs have been FDA cleared, the space is growing rapidly. In stage two, so that was stage one. In stage two, we're running a nationwide virtual trial without any sites. And we launched this in July. And a virtual trial not only lets us give teenagers an immediate resource in response to COVID, it allows us to learn from real world evidence to improve our confidence going into the FDA pivotal next year. So during this stage two, we're gonna run cohorts of 172 subjects with a placebo control arm. That's an educational control app. And working without sites is actually allowing us to recruit faster than we ever thought we could. And so next year, when we go into stage three's pivotal trial, uh, we're gonna be doing that with Duke's Clinical Research Institute who ran a Keeley successful trial of Endeavor uh, for ADHD. Uh, as you might imagine, if you can create a safe and effective treatment for a prevalent disorder like adolescent depression, there's a large market opportunity. And this makes sense when you consider other alternatives, you know, therapy costing over $100 a session or antidepressants, even on the cheap end, are still $500 a year. Uh, and so we estimate that the market opportunity is at least $500 million uh, for Spark in the U.S. and certainly much larger internationally. So a little bit about the Olympics team. We're, uh, as of today, 16 people and a combination of product and clinical experience. So on the product side, it's your typical Silicon Valley mix of engineers, designers, and product managers uh, with experience working at high-performing startups or companies like Google and Facebook. Uh, I myself have been an early employee at two startups that turned into unicorns. One including one, yeah, uh, including one IPO. And my co-founder, Ben, founded two businesses that made hundreds of millions of dollars. And on the clinical side, we're led by our CMO, Dr. Mercer Cruz, who has her JD or her MD from Johns Hopkins, and prior to Olympic, spent six years at FDA in the digital health department. And this makes her the ideal person to navigate Limbics through the regulatory environment. And on her team is uh, multiple PhDs who help us design studies, help us fund these studies with grants, as well as uh, clinical research coordinators who are helping us with recruitment and consenting participants in our virtual trial right now. Um, competition can be put into two buckets. Uh, on the one hand, we have treatment as usual. That's going to be things like psychotherapy, which has long wait lists or antidepressants with concerning side effects. And on the other hand, we have the new breed of digital therapeutic companies. Um, but many of these companies have been focused on adult age disorders. And so uh, we, we think we're pretty uh, niche focused with pediatrics, with the exception, of course, of some of the cognitive disorder companies uh, going after ADHD and autism. Uh, Linux is probably the only uh, company building prescription digital therapeutics uh, exclusively, exclusively for the pediatric market right now. Uh, so okay. same with the drug company, we anticipate Limbic Spark to receive I'm coverage. sorry, the time's up. We have no problem. Questions. Uh, happy to end it. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll go to Parth first um, and then go to Matt and Christine. Um, Parth, if I just may, um, if you can um, just ask one question and then if there's more time, we can just come back and ask more questions. Um, uh, so, um, I'll let you take it away. Yeah, uh, sure. Hey, hey, John, congrats on the, on the great progress. Um, my question is, you know, how is the therapy itself delivered or how are you envisioning it's going to be delivered and is the family included in, in treatment at all? Yeah, it's a really good question. So, um, the, the, the program is, is really delivered straight to the, um, to the patient, to that, um, uh, to the child through a mobile app. Um, you know, during consenting in the research process right now, we obviously have to uh, get consent from both parents and children for, for people who are under 18. Um, but to date, we haven't really uh, envisioned using, like uh, making an extra set of the product for parents. If anything, we're gonna spend probably more of the effort on the things like a provider portal uh, to really help link them with the patient. And oftentimes, a lot of times that patient might be 
even yeah, some of their depression symptoms might be a byproduct of the parent. And so we, we do want to have some separation there. Perfect. Thanks very much, Parth. Let's go to Matt. Hey, John. Good to see you again. Um, hey, talk a little bit about the business model, how you're going to price it, who's going to pay for it. Yeah, so that's, that's really a good question. Uh, we do envis envision this being covered as a pharmacy benefit. Um, the price point has yet to be determined. We're going to have to run a health economic study to, to really get a true idea of that value, but we're probably going to want to try to work with a chip office and figure out a way to, to make it really uh, attractive for um, some of the non-private pay markets and to because we really see this as something that's about improving access. Um, and so that would be, uh, we don't have a fixed price idea of that yet though. Great, let's go to Christine. Great, um, John, really uh, love the concept that you're building here. Can you talk about um, your specific user experience for teens? So there's a lot of CBT kind of out there online today, very effective, so what about this program makes it um, more relevant for teens and how interactive is it? So if the teen starts to escalate or express suicidal ideation, what are some of the escalation points um, to make sure that gets addressed? Fabulous question. So if you're making a depression app and it's meant for someone our age, it's not necessarily going to be designed to work too well for someone 13 to 18, right? And so uh, it's super important to build a high quality user experience. And so one of the things that we have done is we have a teen council and we had to go through a specific IRB approval for that to basically always have a group of people that we can constantly study and test different things that drive engagement. And that's incredibly important. One of the things that we've learned out of that was, for instance, we have this character called Limbot. Limbot is an avatar that takes you through the program. And the way that Limbot interacts with the team, the way you decorate your Limbot, things like that, those are all really meant to drive engagement with the program. And so we wouldn't have been able to do that without actually studying and working with teams directly. We literally have a person full time whose job is to do that and to uh, work with teams uh, to basically understand the user experience and make sure that we can make it great. Um, and, and I think that you are right. There are a lot of CBT apps out there. I think like less than 5% of them have evidence that they can point to and even fewer of them are uh, prescription products. And so uh, I think there's certainly a lot of opportunity within there, especially, you know, when we're focusing on a tight age range, something like 13 to 18, or, uh, or even if we expand a little bit beyond that to 21, it's something where we could uh, really make something much more specific for them. Your second part of the question on safety and escalation. So in the, in the virtual trial that we're running right now, we have a clinical research team that monitors uh, all responses in the app daily. Um, and then what we're looking for are any red flags in there that could potentially show a sign of harm. Anybody who's in the study is already seeing a primary care physician. And so there is a process in place where we can help them uh, if we're sensing something in need. You know, obviously the number one goal of Limbix, you know, when we think about this is like trying to reduce suicide. And so this is something that we're really concerned about and to put a lot of effort into both the user experience to make it highly engaging for someone, but not overly engaging that they're addicted to it all week, right? But uh, also be able to get value out of it. Thanks, Christine. Right. We have a little bit of time left. Does any judge have a second question they want to ask? I guess not. Thank you very much, John. You're most welcome. So just to close out what I couldn't quite get to at the end of my presentation is, you know, we did just recently raise the Series A following the results from uh, our last stage one feasibility trial. And there's just a tiny bit left in that round that we are saving for the right strategic investor. If you think this is a space of interest to you, I'd be happy to chat with you after this. Excellent. I love how you made use of that time. Thanks. Uh, so moving on, our next speaker is uh, from Suresti Health. Suresti has ex expertise in virtual care for seniors with cognitive impairment. The company's digital health programs engage members with cognitive impairment via their family caregivers. They improve family caregiver effectiveness and leverage predictive analytics to reduce hospitalizations and costs for members and increase quality of life for caregivers and members. Their customers are Medicare Advantage, health plans, and at-risk providers who can realize cost savings in a large growing and not currently engaged population of vulnerable and costly members. Dirk Sunson, Sunkson, CEO, will be presenting next. Please take it away, Dirk. Hi, everybody. Um, 
Please share my screen here. Perfect, your time starts now. Okay, so uh, again, thank you for being here. Um, Soresti is really have expertise in virtual care for seniors with cognitive impairment. Now, what do we mean by that? So first of all, I think, you know, we, we consider ourselves to be the leader in this emerging space. So cognitive impairment means what you probably are familiar with. It's um, Alzheimer's disease, stroke, Parkinson's, um, traumatic brain injury, other conditions where, where people who have this condition really struggle with self-management. It's actually an underserved population of about 14 million people in the Medicare space. And what's really significant about this population is that they're driving 65% um, in some cases higher of all of the preventable hospitalizations in Medicare. This is a several hundred billion dollars a year in cost. So just think about it. Um, for decades, people have been trying to reduce hospitalizations. There's a category of hospitalizations that are preventable and almost two thirds of all of them are attributable to people with cognitive impairment. And you might sort of say, well, I didn't know that because nothing is being done in healthcare to really support people with these types of conditions. So what's happened is that the pandemic has, of course, accelerated um, the need for telehealth solutions that can deliver this. And Soresti is the first company to come to market with a specialized telehealth program for dementia, which is built on a platform that we can expand to other conditions like stroke and Parkinson's and so forth. The total uh, available market for our solution is about $3 billion a year. Um, what we're seeing in part because of what's happening in the pandemic is just increasing traction with Medicare Advantage health plans. In part, we've validated our product market fit here and we're seeking capital to really address uh, existing and impending contracts that we have. So what's special about cognitive impairment is that you have to take a caregiver centric approach. This might be obvious, but somebody with cognitive impairment can't self manage they actually, as a result of not being able to self-manage, have lots more chronic conditions. So um, their hospitalization rate is typically three or four times higher than people who don't have it. And they're typically not included in traditional um, care management programs. So the key here is that they rely on a family caregiver, a spouse, an adult child, another family member who is inexperienced, may have high stress and other challenges due to COVID. And what we really do is we have this telehealth program that engages patients with this condition Right, through their caregivers. And we do this through a platform that takes technology, so you know, tablet, smartphone app, content, right? So a lot of educational content. We have a remote coach, think of it like a social worker, and we cover a very broad scope. We do medical, psychosocial, we connect people to friends and family in a great community. And so, so that's a big part of what we do. We also use predictive analytics to try to identify why patients are most likely to go to the hospital, and then we train their caregivers appropriately. So um, we can, again, use claims data and say, well, here's somebody who's likely to go to the hospital because of a stroke uh, or, and so forth. And so then we're essentially um, using risk mitigation. The key to us is that we've engaged people for about 45 minutes a week. We have super high satisfaction, and we've demonstrated cost savings with $33. Um, we provide a complete solution and a business model that goes from a PMPM -PM to a PEPM. Um, we have a number of payers and providers that we're actively working with. This is what we're looking to seek money for. And the management team comprises um, two people that have worked with a company called Aperio, myself, my CTO. I started this company, Aperio, and sold it for a couple hundred million dollars to Danaher. And then I have three people who have deep expertise in the Medicare Advantage space. Uh, Chris Delecki, Gordon Norman, and, and Rob Leonardo, um, who've been guiding our progress here as we figure out how to, how to find, a, find a place for this solution in the Medicare Advantage space. So um, thank you for your attention. That's great. Thank you very much, Dirk. Um, we'll go to questions now, and let's start with Matt. Thanks, Dirk. Um, can you talk a little bit about how the product is priced, and then also talk about um, how many users do you currently have? Yeah, so the, the pricing is really intended to be um, sort of a fee, like a monthly fee that covers our costs. Think of it as like $100 a month, and then we would typically achieve, achieve shared savings. So a typical patient has maybe a cost of $30,000 a year, $2,500 PM, PM. So our view is we can save you know, 20% of that. And so if you think about a $500 savings, we charge $100 to cover costs, and we could share the $400. So this leaves you with a very attractive pricing model with, uh, with high margins. 
to date, we've probably got 300 people who've been through this program for maybe six to nine months. Right? We're deployed with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Minnesota. We're just announced the pilot with Harvard program. And we're in many discussions with other plans to do some sort of demonstration projects. We've raised about $5 million to date in the company. Perfect. Uh, we'll go to Parth next and then to Christine. Sure. Um, great job, uh, Dirk. And, you know, my, my only question is just, you know, how you facilitate connectivity um, between the caregiver and kind of all the other stakeholders, the broader care team that's maybe involved in the semi-members care. Yeah, so it's a, it's a key question. The, um, the, the thing that I, I probably skipped over very quickly is that the key to our success is this ability to get 45 minutes a week of engagement. So think about something that you do for 45 minutes a week, week after week after week, month after month after month. So we've demonstrated that our coaching relationship with the caregivers and the involvement of the technology gets us 45 minutes a week, and we can get three risk assessments a week. So one of the things we do is we ask the caregiver to check in about the health of their loved one. And then if we find an issue that's potentially preventable, we alert the provider. And so, so the ability to be eyes and ears in the home to detect issues before they become emergent issues that might lead to an ED visit is really our secret sauce, right? And I would say there's probably nothing in healthcare today where you have eyes and ears in the home almost 24 seven. And it happens to be for the most costly and vulnerable population. So it's really these risk assessments that are unlocked into alerts to a provider that allow us to save money. And that through the work of some of our um, partners have already shown cost savings as high as 33% of Medicare Part C. Great, uh, thanks Bart. Let's go to Christine. Thanks, Dirk. Uh, my question is, uh, for this type of service, uh, what is your expectations on the engagement for the family care caregiver? Are, is the thought that they would use this in perpetuity? Is there kind of like a set, um, you know, treatment um, for a certain amount of time that, that you would anticipate? Um, and what have you seen about uh, the engagement rate, maybe kind of six months, one year out? Yeah, so it's a it's a really good question. Um, if you if you know much about Medicare Advantage health plans, you know they have lots of things they have to do, including gap closure. They have to adhere with HEDAs, caps, and HOS measures. These are all ongoing um, activities. And of course, people with dementia and, and other conditions, it's a degenerative disease. So I think with more development, we'll get to the point where we can actually engage people continually, where they'll enjoy that. We've done this now for nine to twelve months. We have what we call a month-to-month -month opt in rate, right? So people have to opt into our program, otherwise, you know, they, they essentially opted out and then we don't get uh, charged in some cases. So we've seen a um, month-to-month opt in rate of about 95%. I think over time with more development, we can increase that to even higher, but you know, we are seeing 45 minutes a week in many cases, six months out, right? Our net promoter score is close to 90. So we know that we're delivering something of immense value to these caregivers, particularly in these super challenging times where they're kind of locked into the home, taking care of a loved one who really almost can't be left alone maybe because of their cognitive impairment. Great, Thank you. we do have a little bit of time left, so happy to have uh, another judge uh, ask a question or two. I do have a follow-up question. Um, you talked about telehealth for dementia. Is the thought that, um, uh, to use this platform, the caregiver is with the patient in the home together and they are interacting with their physician? Or is there, is there aspects where the patient is ever kind of engaging in the platform alone? I'm just trying to understand, you know, what that interaction looks like. And then I'm specifically curious about, you know, the possibilities of this tool for medication adherence, um, specifically for this population, because that's always a challenge. Yeah, those are, those are great questions. Um, taking the last part of your question first, there's no, I mean, we are measuring medication adherence in some of the studies we're doing. We think there's tremendous opportunity for caregivers who maybe are giving medications to the loved one to make sure that, you know, they're adhering to medications, getting annual flu shots, all the things that determine sort of quality of care. Um, 
The platform works well for spousal caregivers, right? So part of the spousal caregivers could be 80 years old, same age as their care recipient, can't use technology, but yet we are able to engage in technology. So that's sort of where we start it. We have a smartphone app and other technology that let's say an adult child caregiver could use. So they don't have to be living with their loved one, right? We want them just to have enough sort of understanding that they can maybe help with making the right care decisions. Um, we do have an element of our technology, which we call digital therapies, which engage the patient directly with reminiscence therapy, music therapy, and other things. And that, that's really enjoyable to somebody. And if the caregiver can give the tablet or the technology to somebody with, let's say, dementia and get them engaged in that, um, it gives them some opportunity for respite. And it's been shown to improve uh, positive emotions and, and with activities of daily living. So there are cases where the technology is used directly with the person who has the cognitive impairment condition, but the primary relationship is through, you know, the, uh, the family caregiver. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dirk. Thank you. So our next um, speaker comes from Current Health. Current Health provides the leading remote healthcare platform to help monitor, manage, and engage patients at home. The startup combines a continuous ICU accurate wearable vital sign sensor connectivity with other devices, symptom chatbot, and video visits into a single platform. Powered by advanced analytics, the company's platform offers healthcare providers the real-time insights they need to make proactive and informed decisions about patient care. This improves patient outcomes and experiences while reducing the cost of healthcare delivery. Chris McCann, CEO of Current Health, will be our final presenter. Go ahead, Chris. Thank you. Hey everyone, um, so first thing I'll say straight off the bat is I'm clearly not an American. I know it, it sounds like I'm from Texas, but actually I'm, I'm from Scotland, so I'll apologize in advance for my, my crazy accent. Um, our focus as a company is on helping large health systems uh, transition the delivery of healthcare from within the hospital to the patient's own home. Um, we actually started out originally on the inpatient side. We wanted to radically improve the capture of vital signs on the general floor of the hospital. I started the company as a, as a med student and kept finding patients who had effectively died in their bed because of our poor monitoring. And that problem is just considerably worse when the patient um, goes home. We're now at about 70 employees. This year has been kind of crazy. We've seen about a thousand percent growth. We're on track to hit um, 8 million QRR, ARR, sorry, in the next quarter. So we start out by um, drop shipping to the patient or providing them in hospital with a kit that contains everything they need to get up and running in our remote monitoring service. And that includes us taking care of the connectivity for them. About one in four Medicare patients don't have home connectivity. So the final mile was incredibly important to us. And we focus incredibly hard on patient simplicity. So everything that comes in the box is ready to go, pre-configured, um, works straight away. The next part is then shining a light on the patient's health at home 24 seven. We want to deeply understand their health around the clock when they sleep, after they take medications, what happens when they mobilize. So we give them an audio sized device that they wear on their upper arm to track them 24 seven across a broad range of vital signs. We have the most accurate all-in-one um, vital signs monitoring device on the United States market. It's an FDA cleared device. So this gives us an unprecedented level of insight into that patient's health as they go about the day. We're also a platform for integration to other best-in-class devices. So most recently, we announced a partnership with Dexcom. They're a $50 billion market cap company. They're probably the best in the market for continuous glucose monitoring. And that gives us access to a configurable range of parameters depending on that patient's disease really are trying to capture the broadest picture as we can 24 seven. We then either integrate that into Epic or Cerner or, or one of the other EMRs or present it on a dashboard to the physician or to the care manager 
so they can see that patient's health easily on one view and flag up for them patients who we um, suspect one minute um, developing some kind of disease. We allow definition of effectively clinical algorithms that flag patients that we are becoming concerned about based on all of the metrics that we're capturing on them, our vital signs, symptoms that they've reported, demographics, to try and give us the most contextual alert that we can and reduce false positives. And then we make it super simple for the healthcare professional or indeed our own 24-7 nursing monitoring team to video visit that patient and intervene. We sell direct to providers. Um, our value proposition for them is one, reimbursement, which typically we see them using to achieve cost neutrality, but then reducing the overall cost of care. And we're already seeing some staggering figures. This is from the UK, but we've just replicated this in the United States as well. So thank you very much, everyone. Uh, lovely to present to you all. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, the only thing I can say is that I would never apologize for having an accent like Sean Connery's, honestly. So <laughs> we, will, Thank you. <laughs> we will go to questions now. We'll start with Christine and then go to Matt and then Parth. Agreed, Christopher. Great presentation and, um, and the accent made it much, much better. Um, so my question is about your, um, your reimburse, reimbursement pathway. Can you walk us through that? This, it, seemed to, um, it seemed to me that one of your primary customers was the hospital. So how are they um, you know, reimbursing for, for this type of service? It feels like there's you know, accessories involved plus the platform. So which parts of that um, will be covered versus not? Yeah, so there are four CPT codes now for remote patient monitoring. Um, there are two for patient setup, education and outreach, and there are two for physician time, although that time as of January 1st, 2020, can now be delivered by care managers or other auxiliary staff. Um, with, they can bill effectively in 20 minute increments. So with our system, because it's continuous monitoring, more data, more time can be spent monitoring the patient. It can justify a greater amount of billing, usually somewhere between $250 and $300 per month. We've also seen systems um, use it as a way of increasing their CCM, their, their chronic care management billing time, and even on their transitional care management time as well. So there are actually three separate sets of codes that can be used to use the bill for this on the, on the system or physician side. Does that answer your question? It does, thank you. Uh, let's go to Matt. Thanks, Chris. Uh, you know, this seems to be like a really crowded space, in my opinion. You've got some pretty established players like Entito Care and um, Honeywell and others. Like, what, what makes this product different? Um, maybe touch on yeah, that. So the, sure. Um, so the, the first thing is the fact that we offer continuous monitoring. And um, we're pretty unique in the space and the breadth and depth of the continuous monitoring that we offer. The second is the type of partnerships that um, we have in our system. So things like Continuous Glucose from, from Dexcom were the only platform to get access to Continuous Glucose data. And then the third and the bit that I think is the most important is the sophistication of the analytics. So and we see this time and time again from our clients. Um, most RPM vendors in the space largely allow alerts to be flagged for things like, hey, someone's weight's increased by five pounds um, over the course of a day. What we do is allow consideration of long-term trending health in combination with demographics and patient reported symptoms. And all of these things together, we find leads to a far more accurate, so sensitive and specific alert. And ultimately what these three things all lead together to is higher acuity patients, so higher risk, things like class three, class four heart failure patients can be managed in our pathways. Um, and we can get them to PCP visits earlier than traditional RPM platforms can, which means we can reduce cost better than other RPM platforms can. Great, let's go to Parth. Uh, Thanks, Chris. Great job. And, um, you know, my only question is, how do you think about attributable ROI? I, I know 
a lot of what you focus on is, is in monitoring, but then I think part of controlling clinical outcomes too, right, is, is the actual delivery of the intervention itself, if, if necessary. And I know you do some televisits, but, you know, may, maybe there's an actual intervention like ready responders that needs to go into the home and, and, and actually um, deal with something that maybe is a little bit higher acuity. And so we'd just love to understand, um, you know, how, how your provider clients think about that and, and, um, and maybe if you could point to a couple of specific metrics that, that might be helpful. Yeah, so it, it, it depends on the client. I think the, the first thing to say is we typically try our best not to focus on the monitoring. Um, it's my belief that the, the, the real benefit of remote monitoring is, is not in the monitoring itself. It's using the monitoring to flag a call to action and get the patient the most effective intervention possible earlier. Um, I think there are, there are two groups that we see. So the, the first one is, and this is predominantly with the health systems, yes, they will use reimbursement to try and get to a cost neutral implementation, but they aren't necessarily looking to get two or three X their investment on reimbursement. And um, where they are looking to make a saving is one, if they can shorten length of stay by one or two days, which we've seen consistently that they can, then they can make a significant margin improvement on their DRG payment. The um, second one is then, can they reduce readmissions within the subsequent 30 to 90 day period that they have some fiscal responsibility for? Um, but we've seen them predominantly focus on the uh, length of stay reduction as being the, the primary driver for them. The, the second group is the managed care organizations and I would group within this things like um, Medicaid Advantage plans. And with them, it's kind of split down the middle of can we reduce overall cost of care? Although typically we focus in more on specific clinical outcomes, like can we move their HbA1c in diabetic patients because that can then affect their star ratings and improve their overall um, cash collection? Or on can we optimize their medical loss ratio by getting patients to PCP visits earlier and thus avoiding acute hospitalizations and costs? Great, thank you very much, uh, Matt, and thank you very much, Chris. Uh, well, we've heard from all five startups right now, so I think it's time for the audience poll. So let's go ahead and launch the poll, and we'll take 30 seconds to submit your um, poll. So perfect. I wanted to uh, mention that while Walter is getting the results together, um, if anyone is interested in learning a little more detail about each of the startups that presented, all of their executive summaries are um, pasted or uploaded into the chat. So please go ahead and scroll in the chat to be able to uh, see uh, a little more information about each of these companies. And then for tomorrow, um, I would love for you guys all to come back uh, at 12.30 Eastern. We will be discussing the mental health and loneliness epidemic that has gripped our nation um, for a while now. And it's been, of course, uh, exacerbated by the COVID-19 situation. We will have investors, providers, and tech startups on the panel. And then again, at 3.30 Eastern, we will have uh, another Pitch Perfect contest, uh, this time with five startups that are aiming to help payers and providers become much more efficient. I believe that we're ready with the results uh, right now. Walter, if you're ready, let's go ahead and show the results. Excellent, looks like Current Health is the winner. So let's go to Chris for a few words. 
<laughs> Thank you, everyone. Um, greatly appreciated. This has been a, a wild year for everyone. Um, but I, I think for us and our team, it's been uh, a, a truly sensational year with the, the growth that we've seen. Um, so thank you very much, everyone, and be safe and be well. Perfect. So again, thank you. A big thank you to all the startups. I know you're Zooming in and out of many, many virtual sessions and conferences. So I appreciate you taking the time to present here. And of course, a big thank you to the, all the judges that took time out of their days to ask these very interesting questions and putting the startups on the spot. Um, we are going to hold a quick meetup for all of you who have, attend, uh, who have attended the session and anyone else who wants to come. So that networking link is going to be pasted in the chat. It's on a platform called Remo. So I'm going to be going there and the Med City News is going to be going there. So I hope to see you all on that platform shortly. Um, so um, thank you again for all of you um, coming today and listening to us and see you um, in Remo in a bit. Thanks very much.